Saturday for you, Tim. It's going to be good? Uh, I've been aware it's supposed to be rubbish. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome uh, to uh, number 32, I guess, this uh, photo sharing discussion. we got Frank in California, Tim in London, and me right in the middle here in Atlanta. So uh, we are uh, we're covering, was it, eight time zones, I guess. So not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, but we got quite a quite a few images uh, to to talk about. Uh, Frank's posted some, Tim's posted some. I've posted a few, and um, a few other people that normally post but uh, aren't gonna, uh, aren't here yet. But they might pop in a little bit later. Uh, uh, posted as well. So I'll kind of dig into that, and then I want to talk. I guess when we get done with that, um, talk a little bit about um, zone focusing. Are you guys. Frank is probably aware of that. That's a relatively new concept to me. I don't know. If, have you employed that at all, Tim? No, I'm not shooting. No, it's idiot. Okay. Okay. Um, I've started doing a little bit of research on that because we're going to be going out to, I'm hoping tomorrow, if the weather is decent, we're going to go to a, a, a Halloween parade in a very um, a cool part of town. So I'm going to try to run through a couple rolls of film on the, uh, on the Olympus. And um, that's one of the techniques that a lot of street street photography types use to, to, to be able to get good shots uh, without having to spend a lot of time focusing. So we can talk about that after we're done. But um, I want to jump into the images here. And last week I was doing that uh, that new format that Flickr had, and I I didn't really like it, so I, I stopped it. Um, but here we are. Here is the group, and we got some good images. Uh, where did we stop? I think we stopped with this one last week, right? I think. Or not. When did I post this? Uh, no, this was um, this was after, so I guess maybe we didn't talk about these last week, I don't think. Yeah, but this was your first shots with the Olympus, weren't it? Yes. I was talking yeah. about that I'm uh, going to shoot a roll, so I'm going to go ahead yeah. and get to the group, and we'll, we'll get to that um, in my manner, but yeah, there were a couple images in there from the um, group. Uh, this is what we what we um, had last week. Uh, I think this was the last, was the image of the camera. Um, and I'll get there. Alright, so yeah, this is what I think we talked about last week. This was a shot of the camera that, uh, that I got Olympus some film and Went out and used it the next day, took a shot of roll of film, uh, developed it. Uh, it was just basically a walk in the neighborhood, so nothing real dramatic, except we did go by a, a, a local graveyard and get some, get some images there. So mm -hmm. um, that was, it's a camera and it seems to work great, so I'm, I'm very happy with it. Um, I'm going to probably do a couple more rolls of film through it tomorrow, uh, but uh, that was... It's, pretty, it's yeah. a pretty straightforward camera. Yeah, it is. It's all manual. Everything works. That was the main thing for me, uh, and I thought it would. Um, I, I felt pretty good about it because I bought it from a guy who was very serious into film and takes good care of his stuff. So, uh, but it, it, yeah, just getting used to the controls and using it. The thing that's unique about the Olympus is you've got both the shutter and the aperture on the lens, so it's a that's a little more unique. Um, but here is a picture from. Um, from Joe, um, let's see, uh, from uh, Joe D, who is, lives in Albuquerque, and um, every October they have the uh, Albuquerque Balloon uh, Fiesta, um, and it's the first, second week of October, and um, uh, they run it for, they have early morning hot air balloons, hundreds of hot air balloons. Uh, from all over the world, show up to Albuquerque for uh, for a week, um, maybe ten days of uh, of hot air balloon events. And they've got this huge balloon park uh, north of town, uh, where all the balloons take off from. And mo a lot of stuff starts before sunrise. And Joe is out here in the morning, um, and that's east there, obviously sunrise. And so he turned around. All the balloons are behind him at this point on the field. So he just turned around and took this um, took this shot of the of the tents and whatnot there um, with the uh, with the sunrise coming up over the uh, over the Sandia mountains which is on the eastern edge of, uh, of the Albuquerque metro area so kind of uh, 
kind of a neat shot. Very, uh, the colors are great. I mean, I don't know. This was maybe right before sunrise, uh, but then you've got all the people out there. You know, all the booths and tents set up for uh, uh, to watch all the balloons take off in the morning. So very cool. We've been out there twice for Balloon Fiesta, and it's a fantastic event. So, so many um, cool balloons, colorful, just a lot of activity, just a really, uh, if you get good weather, really beautiful. Uh, hey, there's Christy. Um, I saw, yeah, I saw your question, said that you couldn't get in. Uh, I guess you can get in. So, thank you, Christy. Glad you made it. Um, I'll open up the chat here and see. Uh, okay, yep, Christy's in the chat now. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. Um, have you ever been to, to Albuquerque at all, Frank? No, no, I have never been. I, okay. the last time I was in Arizona was when I was a little kid in grade school. Went to okay. did the uh, Grand Canyon trip with my parents. Oh, okay. Yeah. But that was a long, long time ago. But I have been to a balloon um, event. And the, which was quite a long time ago. And I actually was using, at that time, uh, infrared film. Oh, okay. And that came out really, really cool because the balloons being hot come out white on the infrared mm -hmm. and the sky comes out jet black. Yeah. So the juxtaposition of this glowing white orb in the sky next to a black sky, it was, it's really striking. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's cool. So I just love the balloon fiesta. So like I said, we've been out there uh, a couple of times and just a great time and it's really lots I mean you just go through well you used to say go through so much film you go through a lot of images <laughs> frames yeah. whether it's film or uh, or digital um, I've got a bunch of images I took last time we were out there which was 2008 or 9 uh, and I've got to go through I was just using an, an Olympus uh, I think it was a super uh, a Canon super zoom camera but I've got some good images I just need to go back through and take a look at them but uh, and here's another balloon image. Um, one of the highlights of the uh, of the balloon fiesta is all of the what they call the special shape balloons. It's all the balloons that are non-traditional shape, and they have a, bees. And I've seen these these be, these balloons have been there for a number of years. But uh, as Joe said, you want to get the money shot of them kissing. <laughs> They're two separate balloons, and if they set up next to each other. And uh, you're ready to take off. You get the you get the, uh, uh, the two balloons, quote unquote, kissing. And um, but just super colorful. I mean, that's yeah. uh, uh, just a very cool, very cool thing. So Joe uh, Joe goes out there typically a couple mornings uh, each year since he lives there and, and gets a bunch of images. So um, very nice. And there's Christy. She is in the chat. Um, Talking, uh, she's took a trip up to upstate New York, I guess, like Christy, and uh, got some cool waterfalls um, with, a yes, couple of, with the fall colors in the background and the waterfall. I mean, that's, yeah, Finger Lakes, New York, she says. That's pretty much about the best time to go see a waterfall is when the leaves are changing. So uh, very opportune time. And this is Robert Treeman State Park. And this must be, I guess you're hiking up uh, up to Lucifer Falls, which I guess is the which is the big fall. Um, but really cool. Um, I don't know what the exposure time on this was, but uh, probably half a second or more, maybe. I don't know, but it's got got to be a little bit of length of time because you got that nice pillowy texture mm -hmm. in the water. And um, I like the, uh, uh, the, the yeah, tree limb or whatever kind of in the waterfall kind of breaks it up. The colors along the side here. Um, very nice. Nice, uh, nice front to back with the uh, rocks and leaves. So, yeah. Waterfalls are great. Waterfalls in the fall are even better. Neutral density filters. Okay. I should see she said use neutral density filters to... Dial it down. Mm -hmm. it's a graduated density filter would, would have even brought down the sky even more. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, I've got a couple of those. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, 
and it looks like this is maybe later in the afternoon. I don't know, but the sun looks like it was pretty, uh, yeah. pretty harsh there. But uh, nice shot. But this one I really like. This yeah. is this is very nice because you've got all the color in the back here, um, and kind of the stair step. You got three levels of three or four levels of water coming down, and. Uh, what I, like about, what I like about this one is in the foreground, you have a triangular shape of water that comes to a point towards the center of the frame. And yep. that, that acts as a leading, and not as a leading line, but as a leading shape. Mm -hmm. it, it directs your eye towards the center of the frame, and then you travel throughout the rest of the, mm -hmm. the, rest of the image. And it's, it's a very good use of that shape. Yeah. It's, again, it's looking at the scene as, not as a as a landscape, as a waterfall, but trying to recognize the the, the natural shapes and figures of, of mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah, yep, and that's that's a great observation, and that's something that I'm still. I know I I think I'm getting better at identifying images that I really like, but I'm still trying to pick out, like you said, the shapes and whatnot yeah. that cause me to like a particular image over another, and uh, that is that is a very good point because. You look at that and it's like, oh yeah, there is a nice little triangle there, and it leads right, <laughs> right into the, right into the meat of the image. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, we may even be doing this subconsciously, uh, mm -hmm. and you, you raise an interesting point. Uh, you you know you like it. It's, it's just trying to figure out, you know, mm -hmm. why. Um, I have one of my favorite all-time photographers, uh, just like many other people, is Henry Cartier for song. Mm -hmm. And I've had I have many of his books, and it wasn't until someone had mentioned how many triangles and or uh, geometric shapes are in his image images uh, that I had never really thought about. And then and I went back and opened up one of his books, and page after page after page, it was triangle, 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 triangle on every single image, and it it, it was just like a a moment. And that's almost like an epiphany that I had in my mind that just mm -hmm. that's that's what would made his images partly in part uh, made his images so uh, yeah so good mm -hmm. yep and uh, and that's something that yeah I mean I think I'm getting better at identifying a photograph from a snapshot but now I'm at the point where I I can do that but I'm not quite sure why so I guess maybe that's the the next the next uh, step of that is a, that's, a, that's a great observation because that's exactly what the, you know kind of where the eye goes mm -hmm. in there and, and, and the, the water kind of cascading from out of the frame in yeah that throws you back down and, mm -hmm. and the nice and the color back here mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's very nice and I, I really like the uh, just the the kind of the random leaves on the rocks here to kind of break up the uh, um, uh, the rock. On there, so very nice shot. Good job, Christy. Yes, you do need a webcam, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You think I have to talk to her? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. This is, I think, maybe the fifth or yeah, maybe the eighth or ninth frame I, I took with that with that Olympus uh, camera. This was a, a cemetery. Um, near our, relatively near our house, and all throughout the south here, it corners, just like a, a lot of places, but where major roads cross, there's cemeteries. And this is one of those ones that's kind of hidden off the intersection, back behind, you know, a row of trees, and we've lived here for going on seven years, and uh, I've been here a couple times, but when we went here last week, it was the first time my wife had actually gone into the cemetery. And she loves cemeteries, and she spent the whole time um, looking at the headstones, like the history and trying to track where people were and everything. And um, But it was the middle of the day, so the sun was pretty, and this was kind of shaded a little bit, so I got a little bit better light. And I was just playing around with the focus and everything. But uh, this cemetery is called the Singleton Cemetery. And if you take a look at all the headstones, they're all singletons or probably extended family of the singletons. Um, the earliest grave was maybe 19, there was a, in 1915, 1920, somewhere in that range. A lot of them were being born in uh, 1840 to 1860, that initial, that initial group of, uh, of people. So 
this was one of the ones that came out pretty good. I was I was playing with I don't know what the I think the aperture on this is maybe five point six, but I was trying to you know get good focus on here. I'm, I'm getting comfortable with the camera, but this is a nice old headstone. It's got you know, just age on it, and uh, so that came out that came out kind of nice. Nice clean background too. Yeah, yeah, with the trees in the background. Um, here is um, <laughs> this is the I think the fourth image on this on this roll film uh, was just the crossing. But I was like, okay, that kind of looks cool. I'm gonna try to see how good I can. I, I was about eh, eight feet away, maybe yeah, maybe six feet away. And I just wanted to play around with the focus to see how sharp I could get it. And I got it pretty close, and that's um, that's one of the things I struggle with a little bit on the film cameras because it doesn't have this camera doesn't have a diopter, you know, in the viewfinder, and I have pretty bad eyes. I mean, contacts work pretty well, but having that diopter adjustment on the on the, on the DSLR really helps, so I've got to get used to how things look in the view, in the viewfinder to really make sure that the uh, uh, image is in focus. So I did a pretty good job with this. But I know uh, what you mean. I'm actually legally blind in my left eye. Okay. And that's the eye I used to shoot with. Hmm. It's not that I can't see anything. It's just that things are so damn blurry. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I got my eyes checked the first time, you know, seriously, when I had a high school, the doctor asked me, who drove me? <laughs> and and he, he almost didn't want to leave, have uh, have me leave his office without having someone picking me up. That's how bad my eyes were. Wow. Um, yeah, my, yeah ha having a diopter built in really helps. Yeah. My eyes aren't too bad. I have The thing that gets me is I have a, I have a pretty nasty astigmatism. Yeah, so the doctor says your eyes are like a football. You know, they're not, not shaped properly. So once you correct for that, it's not too bad. But the thing I, I noticed about this after I after I scanned it in and looked at it a couple times is here in the the button that you mm -hmm. push to initiate the crosswalk, that's our reflection. So I just noticed that. I was looking at it uh, a little earlier, but there there I am right there. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I didn't I didn't post a full size image, but it did get the reflection in the. Uh, uh, in the crosswalk button, which I didn't even notice as I was composing composing the shot. But this is a brand new film for me too. This was a Kent Mirror film, just the, the 100 speed, which I guess Kent Mirror is like the off-brand of, uh, off of Ilford. Really? Hmm. Yeah, it's a different emulsion than the Ilford films. From what I read, and it's it was cheap. It was like $2.99 for a 36 exposure roll. I was going to say, I wasn't sure if it was the film or, or what, but the overall image looks rather um, low in contrast. It doesn't seem Yeah, well, this, this is. This was, this was super kind bright of muddy. sun. This yeah. was, there was no, there was just maybe, full, full on sun. So Maybe, maybe it was the film. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. So that was the first time I'd ever shot that film, and I didn't really know how to, there's not a lot of uh, recipes for developing the film, so I just kind of poked around and was like, okay, well, six minutes. <laughs> and it came out, you know, pretty good. But so you developed this yourself? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chris is asking questions, guys. What's that? Chris is asking questions in the. Oh afternoon. yes, yes. Uh, what kind of what kind of wine are you drinking, Frank? You well, this questions. This this is a very special wine. You you actually have to be a member in order to buy it. It it uh, it comes from Kirkland. Um, apparently, it's it's like a place like Napa, but maybe I don't know. Uh, but I bought it at Costco, so uh, it's uh, not exactly a great wine. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's better than two buck chuck. Let's put, yeah. let's put it that way. Uh, Kirkland, Kirkland is you know Costco's brand, um, their house brand, and they make pretty decent stuff. You know, their tequila is pretty good. Mm-hmm. I've had their, vodka. Uh, they have their, their, their vodka is really tasty, too. Right. Not that I would know. No, well, I don't I would. Know. their vodka is not too bad, but I usually buy cheap vodka. Yeah. <laughs> but the, thing, the reason being is I run it through a Brita filter about five or six times. And you I tell really? you, yeah, you can take the, the, the cheapest, most repulsive vodka in the world, run it through a Brita filter, a water filter, about five to seven times. And I, I kid you not, it will be so close to Grey Goose, you'll be wondering why you ever bought Grey Goose again. 
I don't drink that much vodka, but next I'll buy a cheap bottle of vodka and give it a try. Yeah, you got to do it at least five or six times, and it'll, okay. it'll, it'll make it. It'll go from turpentine to really good stuff. All right, there we go. <laughs> Anyhow, back to photography. <laughs> yeah, um, I did get the film online, Christy. I got it from um, Adorama, um, and I bought it specifically just because I just wanted a couple cheap rolls of film. It was, I figured, yeah, for three bucks a roll, if it's decent, I mean, I could use it in my little point and shoot or or whatever. So, uh, and, you know, I've still got two rolls left. I'll probably shoot a roll tomorrow if we go out. Um, and I think I, I think I probably want to maybe develop it a little, a little less time, maybe 540 or something like that, a little less on it. But, I mean, it looks, you know, for point and shoot, basic stuff, it's inexpensive and um, it looks like it gives decent results. So, mm -hmm. uh, sin, Sinestial? Color film? Huh. Is that, um, is that a Kirkland color film? I've never heard of it before, but that doesn't mean anything. Cinema film. Okay. That's like, um, what is that, Seattle Filmworks. Did That's you, who I was thinking about. Thank they used you. to rebrand the, the uh, uh, 70 millimeter. They make 35 millimeter rolls out of it or something like that. Mm -hmm. My dad, my father used to buy that all the time, and it was slide film. So... Back in the set, and I guess they're still selling it, but he bought a lot of that in the late seventies, early eighties when they came out with it. Um, yeah, apparently it had a it had a very um, broad contrast range. It, it didn't it wasn't very snappy, uh, it, like some like like the old Kodak Gold film used to be. Mm -hmm. Kodak Gold film, you could actually lose detail in your highlights on a cloudy day. Uh, that was stuff was very contrasty. Mm. Uh, but when you start using the professional print films uh, like uh, Oh, like the Portra, the, the contrast range is extremely extended, so if, you know you've got a really nice tonality to it. Okay. All right. Yeah, and that's that's, great. Something, that's something I haven't really paid too much attention to yet because I just haven't shot that much film. I I I like the um, I like the Acros 100 and the HP5. You know, those seem to be just be two good two films that I like. I like the HP5 especially. I don't know if it has a broader contrast range in the Acros or not, but it seemed Probably. the tones just seem to be super super smooth with that, and the Acros, like Christy says, is I really like that too. I mean, I like it better than the Kent mirror, but the Kent mirror is fifty percent the cost of the Acros. So, do I like it twice as much? Depends, I guess, what I'm taking photos of. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that raises an interesting point. If you're finding that your contrast is just too much, mm -hmm. what what what? Typically, what I would do when I was when I was doing a lot of black and white film, uh, if I was shooting all in the same area and I knew that all the entire roll, for example, uh, the deepest shadows compared to the brightest highlights were beyond what the film could could render. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say it was like uh, instead of normal five stops, it was like six or seven. I, I would lower my uh, development time. Let's say it was just a, let's say six stops from mm -hmm. the the deepest shadow of the brightest highlight. I would lower my uh, development time by about 20% to bring down the highlights. Okay. And um, if you're doing the entire air, uh, entire scene uh, or the entire roll in the same area and your light is exactly the same throughout the entire roll, you can do that. Obviously, if you're using the same roll from day to day to day, you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, but lowering your, if, if you pay attention to what your contrast range is in your scene, measuring off your deepest shadows and comparing it to your brightest highlights, then you have an idea, okay, this film has a good contrast range, but the exposure, the, uh, the light in the, in the scene is going to exceed what that film can, can render. So I need to lower my development time to make up for it. It's basically the zone system. Yeah, yeah. Or Ansel Adams had the luxury of doing it per, per sheet of film. Uh, which was extremely easy to do it at that, you know, with, when you're dealing with only a sheet, mm -hmm. uh, and not so easy when you're dealing with a whole roll of 24 or 36. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you can really adjust your um, your your times for that. Make it a yeah, nice. and that's that's something. To be honest, I haven't really thought about at all at this point. I've just been I've been just been happy to shoot a roll of film, develop it, and get stuff that looks decent. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, you. That's, that's probably the next step, the next step. Um, but a lot of the film I've shot has been over a couple of days in a couple of different locations, so that would be a little tough. But uh, I mean, I've done 30, 
really on probably 30 rolls of film. I mean, not that much, but I think I'm going to I'm going to find myself doing a lot a lot more film. Um, just because now the, um, the SLR is just really easy to use. Um, I can go through, I can take more images. <clears throat> I can take them a little faster now than I can with the roller cord. So I can probably get through a couple a couple rolls of film at, a, at you know, like a, a parade or out on the street or something like that where the, where with the roller cord it might, I might get just through one, you know, 12 exposures just because it takes a little bit longer for each one, which isn't... Uh, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. But still picky about each frame. Yep, <laughs> that is true. I, and I find definitely, Christy, the uh, even with the SLR, it's still it's still take it's still a lot longer than using a digital camera. So you really have to do pay attention. And I always got the in my mind, it's like okay, each time I push the shutter button, it's it's 25 cents, it's 30 cents. You know, so there's there's real money attached to it. So you want to get you know, want to get your money's worth, I guess. Whereas with the digital, you you buy your your memory card and you've got unlimited images, so you can blast off 50 or 60 and not even care. Mm -hmm. it doesn't doesn't cost you anything really, other than the time to to look at it or if you miss something. So you pay for your premium of not having to pay for your film processing when you bought the camera. Yeah, that's that is true. That is true. Um, all right, go back to the screen share here, and this is. A buddy, um, he's a fellow beer geek, but he lives in Phoenix um, or Scottsdale area, and he does uh, exotic car photography. So he, um, this one, is 1967 Toyota 2000 GT. Apparently, it's a million dollar car. <laughs> so, um, but this is. Pretty cool shot. It's a white car, but he's got the sun kind of coming through the tree there. The sense of motion. I like the, um, I don't know, what do you call this up from, up here? Um, flare. 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 At the front. It just kind of leads. You got the sun behind. You got the flare ahead of it and the car in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. And he does uh, does a lot of exotic car photography. And um, so, you know, all those, all the collector car shows, the Barrett Jacks and all that stuff that's down there, he does a lot of the, uh, nice. A lot of photography for those car owners, and he, I think, I may be wrong, but I seem to remember uh, him saying at one point that he does just all natural light. He doesn't use flash or anything. He just uses available light uh, to photograph uh, to photograph the cars, which a lot of people, when they're doing these kind of things, are always bringing you know off off camera flash and and that type of thing. But he uses uh, available light, and this is. One of those cases. <laughs> yeah, what I like about this image is that flare. Um, you know, if you think back in the '70s, uh, actually this is a late '60s vintage car. But yeah, during that time, those lenses back then were horrible when it came to flare. Mm -hmm. So adding, having, uh, and not you know, foot going in and with Photoshop removing that flare actually gives it a very vintage look. Which yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he knew. Yeah, and I'm, that makes perfect sense, and that's yeah. probably exactly. He kind of tried to f fit the image to the time, right? <clears throat> you know, it's yeah. Pretty sure Patrick is fully aware of that. Yeah, he probably is. Well, I agree with Chris. Steve, she was saying it was round. To to me, I'm wondering if that's a reflection of his car because that's a funny shaped flare. It is. It's very round spots, aren't that to get some flare? Well, he's got. The, if you take a look, it kind of goes around here. I mean, so there's a real big round image of the. I'm assuming that's the front of the lens that's getting reflected back. I mean, you got this large circle here. It looks like maybe that is the front know, element, front of the lens, and then this. There's uh, other internal elements. Yeah, because it's got that shape. It looks like the different elements of the lens kind of going through there. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, but uh, what is a UFO overhead? Yeah, he's. Uh, I, I I'd love to have a car. Anybody got an extra million dollars? I mean, uh, <laughs> hold on, hold on, let me check. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> hey, you've been saving all that money by buying that Kirkland wine. You probably got some extra money laying around, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and fil filtering your cheap vodka through the Brita. Come on, you've got a just cash flowing around now. Saving, saving that, yeah, 
fifty right. bucks at a time. Yeah, <laughs> that's a roll of film each uh, each bottle of wine. You know, you're set. But yeah, so this this is a, just a cool image. Um, the flare, the sun, it kind of complements itself. It's just nice. Um, Joe went out to um, and met up with him and did did some did some photography with him. He said he's just a really cool guy. Um, here's one by uh, by Freak of Nature or John. He, he pops in the chat every once in a while, and um, I'm assuming this is his dog. That's a nice, um, good image of the dog and Buster hanging out by the Guadalupe River. So there you go. Hard to argue with a, a shot of the family pet. So yeah, Buster. Buster looks like a, got a little bit of I don't know hound in him of some kind. Looks like he's a mixed breed of some kind. But uh, cool dog. Neat shot too, with the water on the on the dock and in there. It's kind of that's a nice uh, nice one. And here we go, X-rated. Now this looks like this is a guitar amplifier. So, but triple X. <laughs> nice mac macro shot, I guess. Um, I don't know what he. Oh, one second f5.6, 50 millimeters. So that's kind of neat. Neat. Um, got some reflection in the dials here. Um, just kind of focusing on on the one part of the of the amplifier that's a little uh, a little interesting. <laughs> it's like maybe he's making a making a trip to the uh, to the the seedier side of Sagin, Texas, but uh, it's just a guitar amp, so <laughs> where he's still safe. But uh, nice one. And there we go. It's probably uh, Little Drummer Boy. So I don't know. Having fun at a friend's band practice. That's probably where the other shot came from too. Um, doing that. But I like the the lighting on this. I don't know if it's something coming through the door or a window or something. I suppose just one thing how he shot that because he's lit the drum right without. If it was flash, it'd be coming bouncing off the drum set. Mm-hmm. That's what makes me think that maybe there's just one light there, or this is maybe a window, and wherever they're they're or at. Stage it's, light. Yeah, but it's just one light. It looks like so. That's kind of neat. Uh, is is A330 Sony? Speaking of, did you see that Sony's coming out with a full frame uh, mirrorless? They've yeah. got two coming out. Ah, that the looks like that was a DSLR. <sighs> That's it. That looks like a really sweet camera, a, a full-frame mirrorless uh, camera that's not much bigger than the um, uh, than the Olympus OMD, uh, with a with a sensor that's what three times as big as the fourth micro four as the four thirds sensor. So yeah, it's the four thirds and the four the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's still kind of the body's what anywhere from eighteen hundred to twenty three hundred depending on which one you get. Yeah, it's just plus the lens for that format. I'm sorry. Plus the plus the lens, so you know, in a, in a few years that'll be down to under a thousand probably, because everybody everybody will have one. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's there's some talk that the, the uh, four thirds, the micro four thirds, is really a dead format. That it uh, that Sony and excuse me, Canon and Nikon are looking into medium format. Okay. And, event and eventually, the four thirds, the micro four thirds, is just going to go away because it's just it's not enough real estate to add more pixels and still render good image quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So. Yeah, I don't know. Say, you see, you see a full frame camera that's not that much better than a four thirds. Um, you know, but because it's mirrorless, so you don't have you don't have all that extra space that you need for the mirror. Mm -hmm. um, and you get the, the the size of the camera body down, you know, almost to the size of like the Olympus OM1. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're not joking. Film SLR. So, um, but yeah, yeah, but it doesn't have live view. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. And here's another one from Christy. Nice. Yeah, kind of a, a long distance shot of. Uh, Another fall on the trail to see Lucifer Falls. 
So this is another very nice shot. And there's that triangle again. Look at that. See, there's that triangle. See, I noticed that one, Frank. <laughs> but uh, nice colors in the background. Um, that's just nice framing with the trees around mm -hmm. there. Maybe if you could have gotten a little closer and gotten a little bit of the sky out, but then you would have lost this up front, I would guess. So that was kind of a decision. Now, did you take this with what camera, Christy? Um, I don't see. It doesn't say. She um, just said it. She died in the Oh, it's a PD. Okay, 50D. Yep. <laughs> and very nice. Yeah, so I like waterfalls, and like I said, I'm not forgetting about you. I mean, just <laughs> you, need, you need the webcam, Christy. Then you can just yell at us. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I love waterfalls, and that's one thing. I just didn't have the time this year to get up into the mountains. Uh, uh, of course, Great Smoky Mountain National Park was closed because of the shutdown. So I couldn't have gone up there anyway. I guess they're pretty much past um, past uh, peak at this point as far as color. But uh, I'm gonna try. I'm making. I'm gonna schedule some time next year to get up there in the fall. Now this is really cool. Got this. Um, Best of the bunch by far. Yeah. Pool coming through here. The little mini canyon. I don't know how to describe it, but. Very nice, nice lighting in the in this pool here. The yeah, colors are great. Texture mm -hmm. composed really nicely. So very nice. You get those darn people out of the picture there. Inconsiderate people. Yeah, really. Who are they to get in the way of our picture? <laughs> I always get uh, my wife just laughs at me because I'm I get all frustrated when I'm trying to frame a shot and somebody walks into the frame. She's like, "Well, they have just as much right to be here as you." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know, I know. I just wish they'd leave." <laughs> I get annoyed with the film camera if someone walks in front of you when you just push the button. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had more than a few shots like that. <laughs> well, that's when you use it. That's when you use a neutral density filter to get your exposures up to about a minute. And then people could walk through your frame all they want. They would, they wouldn't stick. They wouldn't show up on your, uh, yeah, on your frame. They would just be ghosts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go through, but yeah, that's that is that's a great shot. But all the, what gets, what I really like is the pool here, and then just the leaves, the color and the leaves sticking to the rocks all the way front to back, just kind of kind of lead you lead you through there. So. I like how the right side is kind of cool in color, the rocks, but in the left side, if you've got a warm color rock, so you've got that contrast. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's a good point. And then, and then you've got the, the little V shape of the sky and the trees on the top. Mm-hmm. That's, yep. that's nice. It's just a well, yeah, well put together image. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Yep. That is... That so is, neat. Yeah, very nice. And there we go. Lucifer Falls. And that looks like it's a pretty good sized fall there. You got one, two, two big drops, and then this cascade at the bottom. And uh, yeah, the moss or whatever this is on the on the rock here is nice. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is a place I'd go back to multiple times throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This this is this great. would be neat in the winter. Frozen? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we need that. We need that. Your 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 parka, your hat, and your mittens, Christy. I want to see images here from like mid January. That would be. This would be really cool to see the falls frozen, and it'd probably be uh, icicles and stuff along the wall here. That would be a, a neat shot. But yeah, this is one of those places where you want to get back. You would if you get back to and kind of document it over the course of a year, the different mm -hmm. seasons. Um, that would be uh, uh, that would be really neat, but yeah, that is and what she says a couple hundred feet, yeah, a few hundred feet. That's a neat neat fall, and that's an area of uh, of New York. Well, the whole all that area up there, New York and Vermont and Hampshire. I mean, just the big rocks, 
lots of water, cool waterfalls, steep mountains. They're not real high, but um, they're really steep and rugged. Uh, I don't use I didn't use a tripod, so I use my water bottle. Wow. Very well done. <laughs> what was the exposure length on this? Uh, see, yeah, okay. Couple seconds maybe. Yeah, I think it would gotta be pretty close. That's a good job with the uh, with the water. We gotta improvise. That's um that is uh Oh, 30 second exposure. 30 seconds. Wow. <laughs> you did a very good job holding that camera still. <laughs> very nice. Excellent, excellent, excellent shot. That's uh, that's one of the ones you want to get printed and hang up on the wall. That's uh, very nice. Very nice image. All right. Here he is. A shot from the Yashica rangefinder from the analog photo walk at the end of September. I finally got through the roll and I, I developed it. And this was just random lady walking down the sidewalk in midtown Atlanta. So um, it was a pretty basic shot, but I kind of like the, um, it would have been better in color because this is a really bright yellow umbrella, but it still came out okay. <laughs> But uh, the uh, I'm, the rangefinder is nice, but it, it takes a little while to get used to the um, you know the focusing how it kind of uh, you have to line things up. And I'm still I haven't shot enough haven't shot enough rolls of film with it to get really quick at it yet. And I think this would be a perfect um, case for me to, to kind of use some of the uh, some zone focusing because this wasn't that far away. And if I would have been paying attention, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I might have been able to get it when she was a little closer, and um, get things get a little bit better image overall. Is it 35? Yes, it is. It is 35 millimeter. Yep. And this is uh, this is Acros. So you were saying that you liked Acros because it was so contrasty. So this is this is Acros 100. Is that a Fuji product? Yes, uh, Fuji. Yeah, I think it's probably my favorite uh, film so far. I've shot the most rolls, both at uh, both in 35 and um, 120. And here's another shot from that same roll. This was at the the car show a couple weeks ago. This was the last frames of that roll. So I had the roll on the camera for I don't know three weeks. This is a um, Ford Galaxy 500. And uh, I, I cropped it a little bit. Um, there was a, a fender ornament up here that was kind of distracting, so this is this is cropped a little bit uh, to get down to it. But um, I think that this was probably a little underexposed. I had to pump up the exposure um, a little bit in Lightroom, um, but it still came out. It's got a it's got a nice classic feel to it, and this was definitely uh, a car, a cool car, but it wasn't fully restored. It was kind of in the process of being restored. So the paint was a little rough. Uh, the chrome wasn't real polished yet. The guy was working on it. He was saving up to get it repainted. You kind of do a little bit of, uh, a little bit of work here and a little bit of work there. So um, I think the image kind of ties in with the car. That wasn't, wasn't fantastic, but it, I like the, uh, I like the fender, the fender ornament. So that's what kind of drew my attention to it. All right, Tim, I want, I want, to, I want the before and after pictures here. So we've got. Yeah. This, that, this was, that, that was what the developers gave me. Okay. And of course, I gave it back, didn't I? I said do it properly. Um, went there a couple of days ago, so they've had it two weeks, and they went, "Are oh, the uh, negatives are damaged? We can't repair it. Gave me my money back." Okay. Yes, they didn't try, so I thought, well, that's had it. So um, it, my dad used to develop his own film. He goes, bowl of warm water, stick a bit of washing up liquid in it, and give them a wash. Thought, well, I'm prepared to take the risk now. It's a lost cause, isn't it? But the next one's what I managed to do. Okay, all right. So the next one is the uh, after you took it to the other lab and they re they rewashed no, no, this, it. This is what I done. Okay. All right. This is the washing up liquid in a bowl. Okay. 
rubbing your fingers over the negative. Wow. Yep. <laughs> you literally just gave the negative a bath and yep, literally gave it a bath. <laughs> Wow. And then, yeah, and then you'll see my uh, state-of-the-art scanner is the next shot because I haven't got a scanner. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this was one of the, this was one of the rolls of the thirty-two hundred, and you took the other ones back and had them redo it, right? Well, yeah, I took them back for them to redo, and after two weeks they decided they couldn't do it. All they done when I got there, they showed me on the screen, and they just run it through Photoshop. And you could just see the loss of detail, the blurring. I said, I want to use a digital camera for any digital artifacts all over it. <laughs> so I just gave my money back. <laughs> yeah, definitely not a lab I want to go back to. Yeah. And a, and a, and a completely great example of why you want to develop your own black and white film. Oh, absolutely. I thought, well... I'd say my dad said he's going to teach me, and I thought I won't start with the 3200 because I had read it's not a tolerant film. Um, and so I thought I'd give it to the professionals, <laughs> and that's what come back. And I went, oh no, I do my talent show on that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, Tim, do yourself a favor, learn how to develop film. It is so incredibly easy. And when and we're dealing with such high ISO, ISO film like 3200. You really don't want to give it to somebody who doesn't know what they're doing because you, you really yeah. don't want to develop it and shake that film too much. Otherwise, your 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 grain just goes through the roof. Yeah. 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 I think really the hardest part of developing black and white film is getting the film on the roll act on the reel accurately. I mean, that's been my my personal experience. <laughs> I've had more. Once it's on the reel, I there's so much resources for um, for time and agitation and all that, depending on the on the developer and the film, that you you really it's pretty straightforward. You know, you just got a, a an egg timer and and some water. Yeah, you can do, you can do a really good job with it. So yeah, um, it's got a um, self loading reel. You sort of put the negative on the end of it and then you twist it and it pulls it through for you. Mm -hmm. Right, for Harrison reels. Yeah, that, that looks quite a nice uh, little setup that does, rather than trying to fill your way around the uh, reel. Yeah, and that's what I switched to. I had the stainless steel reels, and I got the Patterson reels because I got frustrated because I mangled a, a roll of film a, a few weeks ago. And the, the Patterson reels are definitely a lot easier to use. As long as you get it in the at the, at the front, you're just kind of ratcheting it through. Yeah. It, feeds up, it rolls up pretty good. And that's literally, for me, that's the hardest part. Because you can find the recipe, whatever film and developer combination you have, you can find um, the times and temperatures and everything you need pretty much online. Yeah. Well, um, Ilford give it to you inside the box, don't they, uh, how to develop their films? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I mean, it, it is really straightforward. But, yeah, you did a really good job here. You just give the give the film a bath, get rid of, uh, I guess, what was it, calcium deposits or something yeah, like that? Yeah, that's what because I... Sent it to um, Ilford, like on Twitter. I said, "Can you tell me what this is? Because I didn't want to go and scream in the lab if it was something that camera might have done. Because that was the first time I'd used the um, AE1." Mm -hmm. So, uh, but now Ilford said it looks like calcium deposits. They might have calcium deposits in their chemicals, uh, or they've not uh, rinsed it properly. And um, what did they say? Uh, drying marks, but they've used the squeegee, which you almost could see. You could see where they'd run down the negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. I mean, it, it came out considering you know the you know before and after. You know, <laughs> it's quite we're lab to give you that. Do you think that's acceptable? Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. That's it's amazing that they made it out. I and mean, well, they just developed it, tossed it in, and nobody looked at it. You, yeah. Or if they did, what's worse is if they actually looked at it and passed it on. I mean, you know, they really got to be. <laughs> Because that was their scan, because I asked them to scan it, because they haven't got a negative scanner. Okay. <laughs> so you think someone must have been looking at the screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Not necessarily. I mean, a lot of times you can just put the film and hit the button and walk away and do something yeah. else while the, while the film's being scanned. But, but to let that garbage get out of the lab is inexcusable. Yeah. 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 Especially as much as they charge to do it. Yeah. Right. Cool <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. What did you say? It was 10 pounds or something? Yeah, 12 pounds, I think. Oh, jeez. That's almost 20 bucks. Yeah. yeah. 
I would I would expect some quality control there for twenty bucks. <laughs> yeah. They better yeah. give it to you on a on a on a gold leaf envelope for that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's that's a great job. The kind of the before and after and, and here we go. There's the latest in scanning technology. Yeah. That was because uh, I haven't got a scanner. <laughs> So that's just the, the negatives in front of a white screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're a bit with the DSLR. <laughs> there you go. It works. Yep. And then just invert the colors. Uh, Give me done it. <laughs> uh huh. That's a. So, that reminds me. The strangest thing I've ever seen people actually at this new fad is taking film twin lens uh, cameras. And taking a digital camera, and pointing it down at the uh, ground glass on a, a twin lens camera, or right. you know, and then using that as your, and then taking picture of the ground glass. <laughs> and so it's, it just reminded me of what you were doing with your, oh, yeah. with your negatives. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's not a bad I, way of doing it. That negative in, in the shot there is actually like the one I've just shown you. <laughs> that yeah, it is. There, I can make out. I can make out the uh, uh, the guy is sitting there. Yeah. Well, that's a, it came out pretty good, actually. Yeah, you know? so considering I haven't got the negative scanner as well, you can, uh, I'm so chuffed how it come out. Yeah. I think once I actually get a proper scanner, that'll really pull the detail out of the negatives. Oh, yeah. Now, you'll, um, uh, you'll get some really good scans, I think. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, if you can develop, I, for me, half the, three quarters of the fun of shooting film is developing the film. Because it's that whole process of, okay, you've got this roll of film, now you develop it and see what's there. So it's it's just that whole, the whole process of, of going through. And it just seems a little bit more complete than, than digital. So, and like Christy says, printing too. Yeah, it's, it's not over, is it? With digital, you push the button, you've got it. You know you've got it as we... Analog, you've always got that risk, which is what okay. I had in this case. What? Oh no! My, yeah, and you did exactly. Yeah, you, yeah, and Christy, yeah, you just you recently said you just got back, set up your, got back into your dark room and started doing some stuff, which is which is fantastic. You had you posted a really creative print uh, or an image you did last week, I think you posted that on the group, which was which was pretty cool. Um, and that that's something that I, I haven't thought about doing. Painting with developer and fixer. Okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. That sounds much more creative than I could ever hope to do, I'm sure. But uh, um, it's um, so do you um, use develop the film and then by alternating the fixer on the sheet or, or how does that how does that work? That's that seems that seems very intriguing yet maybe dangerous at the same time I don't know. <laughs> Only wipe or sprinkle the developer. Okay, all right. So it's kind of like selective developing on this. It's almost like dodging and burning initially with the developer, then rinse and do the same with fixer. Okay. I can imagine right. it would give it it would give it that wet plate type of look where you're. If you use a brush, you're only developing the area where the developer goes. So okay. you end actually you could actually get end up getting brush strokes in your print. Yeah. Okay. And I know you posted one. I'm going to go back and before we get to yours, Frank, I want to go back because I know she posted that image in the group. Was it last week, Christy? I think you did. I just want to revisit that one real quick because that was, if I remember, was a pretty pretty cool image. Where was it? Or did you post it to the group? Um, no, I think you posted it on... Oh, there it is. Darkroom Alchemy. There we go. And this was an image I think you've you've posted before regular develop, I think, where you took the same thing and redid it, because I remember seeing this lady, this was at the Italian festival or something. Do the same thing in light. Okay. Then turn on light on and do the same thing with developer. Take it outside, expose it to UV light, then fix it and rinse. Wow. <laughs> that is a uh, intricate process, but the result is very, very neat. It, it looks like a looks like a uh, 
It looks like a painting. It's a very, very cool technique. So, yeah, like a waterfall. Yeah, looking, uh, looking forward to uh, future uh, efforts on that, Chrissy. That, that's an interesting, uh, very interesting technique. Okay, let's get back and talk about this one. I've been here a number of times, and this is just a fantastic image. Is this uh, HDR, Frank? No, it's a no? single shot. Okay, single shot. With it's, your just, it, it's, it's just been uh, run through um, Nick Software Color Effects Pro 4. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit too much, but um, you know, when he, when you first buy a set of filters, <laughs> you tend to go overboard sometimes. Mm -hmm. you're, you're still in the, in the process of just playing with it and learning it and just trying to discover what this thing can do. And so that, you know, this is what I ended up with. Um, okay. I may end up redoing it but sometime, but I like it. I like the leading, yeah. leading line of the, of the wall going towards the bridge. Going to the, to the bridge pier, which is a uh, nice highlight um, on the bridge itself there. Mm -hmm. The... Um, uh, this uh, this section here, whatever you want to call it, is got some nice. It shows the age of it. In the water down here. Yeah. I think that's. Um, if I remember correctly, that was due to the uh, the the filter called color or uh, detail extractor. Okay. And that that just really brings out the texture in the water. Mm -hmm. and, and in the rock. So it can, it can if you overdo it, you can give you a really grungy look. And I, I think you're getting some of that in this particular image. Mm -hmm. um, the, that, uh, might, that might be it too, yeah, because yeah, detail extractor does tend to pull out all the all the little nuances. Yeah, it does a lot of local contrasting adjustments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's a beautiful bridge, and there's so many different ways to shoot it the, with the weather and everything that goes. Right. Goes Every day would be different. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a neat image. And a very vibrant color. So, I mean, uh, the, the green here is just, it's like Ireland to green. <laughs> As I, call well, it. I, wondered, I I know the red and the green are kind of opposite colors, so I wanted to, it just like just like this image, mm -hmm. red, and, red and green are opposite, so I wanted to. Uh, now, this one. Just play off that. Looks like you've been, uh, you've been, uh, you've been painting, because this, this looks like, I mean, this is, looks like a nice pastel painting. I, you know, it just very, it's got that very artistic, uh, painterly feel to it. So is this a Color Effects Pro again, or? It is. Okay. And a little bit in Photoshop as well. Mm -hmm. There's not light room for just to play with the, um, with the color saturations. That's mm -hmm. what I love about Lightroom Form is, it, is that you can choose a specific color and then you can just adjust that's color only for lightness and saturation and hue, mm -hmm. without affecting the rest of the, uh, rest yeah. of the image. I, I've pl I've done a little bit in that, but I haven't I haven't spent a lot of uh, time with that. But I mean, so this was one where literally you picked out this this red color here, and and Stuck adjusted that, bit. and then went and did the did the purple back here and the green. Okay. Yeah. Very nice, but you got the that's just that's a nice shot, and you, the effect is, to me it looks like a, to me it looks like a painting, which is a great, uh, the end result perfect. I really like it. Thanks. Yeah, not very good. And very further, I happen to think the treatment works nice. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And like Christy said, the lighting, the lighting is nice too. Yeah, it was an overcast day. Mm-hmm. Drizzling. Like like John said last week, it's like a giant's world's biggest softbox. You betcha. <laughs> All right, and is this from your trip to Alaska? How could you tell? <laughs> is this was this a shot from the same cruise ship you had earlier? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's it's a it's a it's a great shot. <laughs> this actually is a stitched image of two different shots. Okay. I did, I, I did a lot of stitching. You know, with with the with the camera I have, the widest angle lens that I have is a 35, okay. which is the equivalent of a 28 on a full frame camera. 
or an 18 on a, on an APS-C camera. So it's not terribly wide. Okay. And you can see the you know it's 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 rather a panoramic type of uh, of mm -hmm. format. So it's two images stitched together. Okay, and you stitched it right about here, somewhere in there. <laughs> somewhere, something like that. I did a I did a 25 percent overlap. Okay. So I, I just I just let the um, let Photoshop merge them together. Okay. That's, that usually works well if you do about a 25 percent overlap. Okay. All right, and this, uh, Chris, asked what kind of camera this is? A, your Pentax 645, right? <coughs> yeah, this was a 645 Pentax with a 35 millimeter lens. Um, I think the only the fil only filter I used on this was um, I've got a set of Heliopan filters uh, that are uh, the, the they're um, called the digital filter. It blocks infrared and UV light at the same time. Okay. It's supposed it's supposed to um, help with contrast and sharpness. Okay. All right. That's a very cool. Uh, the clouds hanging about halfway down the, the mountainside here. You get the reflection of that in the water. The blue, what? I, the little icebergs floating in the water back here with the with the blue on them, and then this blue here, and then just the green of the hills, and then hey, and and the kind of how the water everything flows through. Yeah, it's a neat shot. Right. I got lucky with I got it's lucky with the birds shot. in the center. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's a neat two shots, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is very cool. Thank you. All right. And here's here's my here's my commuter car. I had Patrick come out and take a photo of it last week. Um, <laughs> Lamborghini. Aventador LP700, very yellow, very fast, very vicious looking. Um, and I guess, I don't know if this is natural light or not, it doesn't look like it, but uh, it's, one of the comments is, was this natural light? <laughs> yes, natural light, fair amount of post-processing. Color correction and a bit of fill light to balance it out. So, that's a... I, I love that shot for for that for that car. The uh, looks like a hangar door in the background. I don't know I don't know what that is, but um, that the car goes about as fast as a plane. I'm sure. Yeah. I'll, uh, uh, all yeah, all two hundred and fifty thousand bucks of this car or something like that. I'm sure is about, about what this thing cost. Yeah, there's apparently some sort of a bright wall on the right-hand side that threw the light back in and has filled up the shadows, which, which helped a lot. Oh, so you're thinking over here, the wall that, that kind of kicked the, mm -hmm. kicked it back? Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a lovely car, a lovely shot. Mm -hmm. yeah, although, you know, you really can't load in, like, four or five bags of mulch and... Go back, go to the Home Depot in this car, you know. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll take my station wagon any time over a Lamborghini. <laughs> but uh, nice, uh, the, the color on that's great. Beautiful yellow car. Very, uh, you definitely, if you drive one of those around, you definitely want to get noticed because you have no other, no other choice than to get noticed with something like that. That's for sure. So... Cool. Well, that's a lots of images, which is great. Which is great. Got some great waterfalls, some great shots of uh, Alaska. The uh, the home remedy fix by by Tim there. You just give your film a bath. Basically, that's the the uh, the tip of the day. If you don't like your image, just give it a bath, wash it up a little bit, and uh, you'll you'll get at least a 50% improvement in the quality of your negative just by giving it a good bath. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I wanted to. I know we're a little bit after after nine, but I wanted to. I wanted to get some feedback. It sounds like you've done zone focusing. Uh, have you played around with that all, that Frank or Christy? I haven't. I don't think Tim has. When, when you say zone zone focusing, are you, are you talking about hyperfocal? Yes, basically taking into uh, account the the hyperfocal distance and then kind of pre-focusing so you know what the depth of of um, Field is for yeah. giving you know, yeah. given aperture and distance, so you don't have to 
Um, if you want to take a candid or something like that, you don't have to hold the camera up to your eye for that long because you know that you've got it in that in that field of reasonable sharpness and focus. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done a lot of that. Um, with, with my film cameras, back in the day, I had a Canon EOS one, uh, and the, uh, the, the EOS series of manual in autofocus uh, film had a DEP mode, a depth of field mode, okay. where you could focus on the foreground, focus on the background, and it would get everything in focus. So it would do that hyper-focal focusing for you. Um, but if you have what you really need in order to do this is a camera or a lens rather that has the uh, the, the the distance scale printed mm -hmm. on the lens. Yep. And so you basically you'll have a series of f stops going in one direction, a series of f stops going in another direction, and from whatever let's say for example f11, from this f11 to this f11, you'll you'll get everything in. In focus. Yeah, whatever, whatever the uh, whatever the focus distance is on the on the right. lens. Yeah, three feet to twenty feet or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Or four feet to infinity if you're using a wide angle. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, when when uh, when I was doing uh, weddings, for example, and doing the reception shots, mm -hmm. I would never focus. I would I would hyperfocal focus to make sure that I'm getting everything from about four feet to about fifteen feet in focus. Mm -hmm. So no matter, you know, you kept the, the person who's dancing during the reception on the shoulder, they would turn around and you step back, and you don't have to worry about focusing in really, really super low light. Mm -hmm. You just took a shot. Uh, but doing still lifes, landscapes, that sort of thing, uh, yeah, that helps out helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because that's one thing I haven't, I haven't really done yet, and um, but I haven't done a lot of... Um, you know, kind of you know, street or people photography, especially candid type stuff, and I think that would be a good technique to use. And Christy said you do it um, when you're when you're kind of doing street or you know out and amongst people. So I want to I want to give it a give it a go tomorrow if we get out there and uh, you know run through a roll of film that way. It should be a decent day, so I'm hoping it's not gonna it's gonna be partly cloudy, so the light should be decent and um, and I'll, I'll give it a I'll give it a try and see. But yeah, I mean the, the Olympus has the has the uh, distance hyperfocal distance on the lens, right. so I can just uh, kind of pre-focus, get get the exposure, you know, plus or minus half a stop one way or the other, and and just bring it up to your eye and shoot. Don't worry about it. Exactly. Yeah. Get but you need the, you need a prime lens to do that. Yes. Effectively, yeah. you can you do it with a zoom, but you have to guess. Yeah. Yeah, and my I've got a I've just I've just got a 35 I'll just use a 35 millimeter lens um, on there and then just figure out you know based on the light get it probably uh, yeah who knows whether I use 100 or 400 speed film just depends on the light I guess when I get uh, when I get there but um, I'm gonna give that a go and see how that works and um, be interesting get some shots in and. Um, so cool. Thanks for the tip on that, Frank and Christy. Sounds like it works pretty good. Uh, and a lot of people a lot of people use it. So yeah. give that a try. Um, anybody else doing any special photography related events in the next week or anything? No, Christy went up to the Finger Lakes this past week. I'm gonna hopefully go to a really funky Halloween parade tomorrow. So get some interesting characters there. Um, I want, to, want to get out, but uh, weather keeps stitching me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're getting you're getting a lot of rain and just cold and rainy stuff there now. Yeah, so the camera might be weatherproof, but the lens ain't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, would you go out? What would be your preferred camera for that? Would you use the AU1 or would you use the 300D? What's that for bad weather? Yes, your bad weather film camera. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, but. Take the 40 D because it's weather sealed. I wouldn't dare take the AE1 out in the rain. Okay, all right. There's too many levers and buttons on top, isn't it? There's too much for it to um for the rain to get in. Yeah. Okay. Too many uh too many uh potential uh, disastrous uh, <laughs> areas for water to leak in and short out a circuit somewhere along the line or get in there and rust something out, huh? Yep. Okay. No. I'm buy oh, you're buying another enlarger. Okay. So for for your new dark room. Or your new your new old dark room, I guess then, huh, Christy? So what? Um, how lo how large will the enlarger be? How large will you be able to 
enlarged photos up to? I mean, I, I guess I've never bought them. I've never used an enlarger. So is it based on the, the size of the paper or the, uh, that you can use? Because that would be buying another enlarger. It's, it's a combination of the lens that you use in your enlarger and how high you can get the enlarger away okay. from the film, or from the paper. Okay. So she says 35 to 4 by 5. Okay. All right. So, and you, you have a 4 by 5 camera? You probably do. You said you had a 645, I think, right? Yeah. That's, uh, Christy's probably got quite a selection of cameras. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a buddy that has two four by fives. Is it a Sinar? Is one of the ones that everybody tends to buy, and then he's got another one, and he just he loves it. He loves his four by five. He's got some amazing, amazing shots with the with the four by five. But it takes minutes, literally minutes, to set up a shot with that camera. You know, he he spends ten minutes. Uh, Wanderlust is making a compact 4x5. Oh, okay. Relatively compact, I guess, yeah. <laughs> it's still got to be a pretty decent-sized camera, I would think, though. Not out yet. All right. Yeah, if, if you look at um, some of the cameras, like um, Zone 6, okay, uh, those are wooden field cameras, and they fold up like a small book. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I, I was looking into 4 by 5 years and years ago, but it was just too, still too heavy. Um, I've got bad back problems, so, you know, weight is a, is a major issue, which is yeah. one of the reasons why I got out of it, but I just couldn't carry my equipment anymore. Yeah, you just don't want to lug, lug around a bunch of equipment. Uh, yeah, I couldn't. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I know um, my buddy had, he brought his, on the analog photo walk, he brought out the 4 by 5 and it was his quote-unquote small four by five, and the thing was still huge. He said, oh, this is great for backpacking and hiking and that type of thing. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, it folded up, and I mean, it looked relatively compact, but wow. the thing still weighed three or four pounds, I think, when by the time it was all folded up. And Well, she's saying 99 bucks for a Wonderlust camera. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta Google that. Wow. That price? That might... I might even try one of those. Check it out. I will. Interesting. Now, does it come with? Uh, does it have different um, lenses you can swap out on it, or is it just a pretty much a a one shot deal? That's interesting. Now you've got me looking, Christy. This is not good. <laughs> uh, so they're not out yet. It's still a prototype. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Well, if you yeah. wander less... Huh. Okay. Oh, it's a Kickstarter project. Right. Okay. That might be one to contribute to. That would be neat. You get a camera for 99 bucks that shoots 4x5? I would... Uh, I'd probably buy it. Oh, they, they've exceeded their goal. Seventy-five thousand. They've got one hundred and thirty thousand already. It's not bad. Wanderlust cameras, Chicago. Hmm, okay, I'm going to mark this page and keep uh, keep up with this. That's uh, that's interesting. Like I need another camera. Oh well. <laughs> Can never have too many cameras. Yeah, I guess that I guess that's true. I like their Facebook page to get updates. Okay, I will do that. All right. Well, cool. Well, I think. Um, I think it's about time for me to go, and I know it's, Tim's, Tim's going to catch some sleep. I can see that clock back there. It says 2.20, right? Yeah, 2.24, yeah. 24. Whew. All right. Well, once again, thanks for staying up late, Tim. Uh, neat to see the uh, the result of giving your film a bath. That was a, that was an interesting thing. And, yeah, you just need to get, get the equipment, develop your own film. I think you'll love it. I mean, everybody I've talked to that's developed their own, starting to develop their own film is it's just it's a lot of fun. It's so gives, easy. Definitely gives you ownership of the images. I mean, that's, that's really what I enjoy about it. It's just you have so much more invested in it, which is a good thing and a bad thing. If they come out great, it's fantastic. If you bungle something up, then you feel really bad. But oh well, it's just fo it's just photography, I guess, at the end of the day. But uh, thanks for joining, Christy. Have a great night. And um, Tim, thanks for staying up. Frank, yep. get another bottle of Kirkland out and enjoy that. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm gonna go down and watch uh, watch some college football here. See if my uh, see if my team wins, so I can win the office pool again. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week. Post some images. Hopefully, I'll get some images from this uh, Halloween parade. I've never been to this thing before, but I hear it's kind of a wild time, so we should uh, should get some interesting images. So hopefully, I can get a couple of those posted by next week. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Thanks for joining yep. in, everybody. Okay. Bye. Later. See ya. See you, Frank. See you, Tim. Bye, Christy.